Yes, so I'm happy that you all are here with tonight. For those that I don't know who's on the call with us, my name is Heather Burton, and I'm Senior Director for Faculty and Institutional Diversity uh, with the Office of Inclusion, Diversity, and Equal Opportunity. And uh, as I stated earlier, myself and Crystal had a vision kind of last year. And so in conjunction with the African-American Studies minor, the uh, Office of IDEO and the uh, Alumni Association, specifically the African American Alumni Association, we decided to start highlighting faculty, specifically Black faculty, um, within our campus. And one of the reasons is that it was brought to my attention that there was this question about who are the Black faculty on campus? Is there Black faculty? And especially from our community. And, and me working closely with many of them, I was like, yes, yeah, Black faculty on campus. I, I can name 10 that I can do an interview right now. And, and I just shared with VP Solomon earlier, the excitement is that we still have a list and names to go without repeating at least for another two or three years. Mm -hmm. And if we keep hiring, that list will continue. And so it's great. And so we use this as an opportunity to get to know our faculty and to get to know our faculty kind of not only in terms of their work at Case Western Reserve, but just the faculty, who are they? And so tonight we have with us John Paul Stevens, known to many of us as Dr. Stevens or JP. And uh, kind of to get us started, JP, one of the things that has become a tradition of the Profiles of Inclusive Excellence is the first question in that lead in. And, and I know that they, I, I, I'm not sure, I don't want to take assume and take for granted that your American movie knowledge is is all encompassing, but there's a movie that was entitled Brown Sugar. And it starred Tay Diggs and Sanai Lathan, and it was based in hip hop. Mm -hmm. And so throughout the whole movie, the premise of the movie was about hip hop. And the question that they kept asking was, when did you fall in love with hip hop? Mm -hmm. And so what we do on our profiles of excellence is we kind of tweak that question and we asked our guests, when did you fall in love with your field of study? And so for you, we know you as the faculty in Weatherhead. Uh, I don't know, is it organizational management? Are you an organization? organizational behavior? Yeah. Organizational behavior. So the question would be, Dr. Stevens, when did you fall in love with organizational behavior? Oh boy. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. And you almost, I got a little anxious just now when you said Tay Dix and Ali, and I'm like, Okay, it's not Love and Basketball, which is one of my favorite movies. And I was like, I actually had the soundtrack to Brown Sugar. Uh, was that the one with Angie Stone? She, was she on it? Most Def, Faramont? Yes. Yeah. I'm just going, I'm trying to go back. So anyway, yes. I, that's, that's taking me back. Now I can give you, I can give you a question from Love and Basketball too, JP, if you want me to throw Love and Basketball, because that's my favorite movie too. So I can give you a question. We can do uh, double or nothing if you want to. Uh oh no, no, I can't <laughs> afford that. So, so where did I fall? Um, I have to say that I do. First of all, I have to. There's an assumption, right, that I do love my field, and the answer is yes. Um, gosh, I think I think if I go back though, I could say I fell in love with academia more generally when. Uh, and this is interesting. You know, being, a, you know, if I'm, I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, being an immigrant, coming to the States for college. So from the Caribbean, we take a long time to answer questions. So I'll get there. But take your, take your time. <laughs> As they say in the black church, take your time, baby. Take your time. <laughs> so, so just, just, I just try to give you some context. So it was, um, you know, being at Morgan State for college. And, you know, so my first experience of the U.S. was a historically black university um my brother whose house i'm in he went to howard and uh and then you know do my degree in psychology but then not being able to do a lot of research because i was an immigrant right i couldn't uh do a lot of the federally funded research that was happening on campus and then going to the going literally a bus ride away across green mount avenue this dividing line in Northeast Baltimore. I'll never forget like the, this, the stark difference between sort of like the black and the white side as the, as the bus cross <laughs> Green Mount. Um, and doing a research fellowship at Johns Hopkins for my, you know, throughout my senior year. So a, a full year. And that's where I got to 
have a seat at the table. I mean, I'm literally, right? So I'd never, <laughs> the fact that I could be part of this lab, this is Barbara Landau's Language and Cognition Lab, um, with, you know, mostly uh, white uh, participants, you know, the PI is white, the postdoc is white. The, um, but to still be included, even as a young uh, black uh, undergrad, right? I'm at, I'm at this table. So even if you set color aside, like just even those academic hierarchical lines and being able to engage with ideas and, um, you know, people wanting to hear what I thought about whatever paper we had to read that week, right? That to me, that's kind of when I fell in love. I always talk about that feeling uh, when when folks ask me about the career and you know they want to get a PhD. And I'm like, you sure you want to get a PhD? <laughs> you know, it's a lot of work. Uh, but I say, you know, I did it because of the love of uh, learning, but also being part of a learning community. Mm -hmm. um, and then from Morgan and Hopkins going to University of Michigan for my PhD. That's so that's where you know I fell in love with the field. I, I always knew for a while I wanted to do um, something applied. Uh, so I knew about applied psychology. I kind of knew about organizational psychology, but uh, honestly, I can't remember like what exactly about it I wanted. I knew I wanted to do something about like the workplace and sort of the psychology and work and. Um, but really at Michigan, again, going back to that sense of community, um, where, you know, I could, I could see, you know, organizations are, are interesting entities, right? They're, <laughs> they're, 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 you know, constructed from human, out of human behavior and they're perpetuated throughout human behavior. Um, so basically any field that touches on human behavior can have something to say about organizations. And at Michigan, uh, where the disciplinary boundaries are so low, uh, you had things where School of Education, Anthropology, Psychology, the Business School, um, you know, folks from all those different uh, disciplines came together to talk about organizations. And that was really fast. So, you know, it just took things to another level in terms of how you could uh, learn and pursue ideas at a very high quality, but doing it as part of um, a collective, you know, group. So I would definitely say it's, it's those formative experiences um, from from undergrad and, and certainly grad school. Uh, and then that, that continues, that gets reinforced. You know, I just came off of a meeting with, um, a past doctoral student who's now faculty herself. Uh, and we're working on a project with a current doctoral student who's about to be a post. So to see that you can give back and also keep learning from from those that you've helped, um, that's been, that's, you know, its own reward. So to me, you know, connections, relationships, those are the things that I study <laughs> and the things that I care about. And, uh, it, you know, it's, it's just more fun uh, living life that way. I love it. I love it. And I think, you know, most people probably, you know, on this call, they may or may not know, but when we talk about even, um, before you came to the States and, and the transition from Trinidad, Tobago to Morgan state, to John Hopkins, to Michigan, to Case Western Reserve, Yep, that's it. That's it. That's all. That's <laughs> and it. so it, even thinking about the population. So what was it? Um, what did you find was the biggest difference in those transitions from early, mm. early life to oh my gosh. your your experience at Morgan State? Yeah, well, that's interesting. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I mean, so look, so Trinidad and Tobago is you know, two, you know, twin island republic off the coast of Venezuela, uh, the most southerly island in the Caribbean. That's my little education piece for the evening. Um, but we're, you know, you know, small little speck on the map, but we're so diverse. I mean, uh, 
ethnically speak, you know, 40% or so of populations of Indian descent, 40% of some African descent. Um, uh, you have Syrian Lebanese, uh, Chinese, Portuguese, Spanish, French, English, um, you know, the Amerindian. So, you know, indigenous heritage is there too. Um, so growing up with all of that as sort of the reality that you're in. And so, of course, you know, there were um, a lot of challenges to that and there still are, but you kind of just accepted that this was, <laughs> this is, you know, we all kind of look different, but we all kind of sound the same. We all sound Trini, right? Uh, even though we look very different. Um, and then, you know, you know, folks like me, you know, we have uh, sort of European ancestry, African ancestry, Amerindian ancestry, and, and uh, you know, the ways that you talk about that or the ways that you distance or embrace yourself from that, right? Um, it, it was just sort of part of uh, that, that sort of mixed upness was just part of life. Um, and so then coming to the States and then specifically coming to a historically black institution where, you know, what was made salient is, uh, so coming from a small place, right, where most people actually look like you to a place where, to a country where most people don't look like you, but then you're in an institution where most people might look like you. <laughs> um, and then also to come with, you know, I had almost 100, 100 Trinidadians in my year at Morgan. Oh, wow. So like, yeah, a lot of the island <laughs> came to Morgan State. <laughs> right. And so you had those dynamics, too. It's just like you're in this little, um, you know, people, this little click. But then, okay, I'm here to ex be exposed and to learn. And so uh, I don't know if I'm making any sense, but just to, just to say that, you know, it was, it was a big transit. It was a big transition mm -hmm. to learn. Uh, I mean, I'm, of course, I feel like we, I, I learned, I studied history in, in secondary school, ordinary and advanced levels. And I, and I care about history a lot. Um, and then learning specifically about African-American history. Um, and you know the black national anthem and the, and the african-american flag and so all those things were just part of of the environment at morgan and learning like oh there is this really rich which you don't see represented when you're consuming american media all your life you know mm -hmm. on a small caribbean island right you don't know that you don't know those things um and so that was a, a revelation um and also to learn from people who, you know, so you were in Baltimore, my first time seeing snow in, you know, December 2000. And <laughs> so like, okay, so why, people ask me like why I would go to Baltimore. And I turned to people from California, I'm like, why are you here? Right? <laughs> and to hear from them, you know, they wanted to be in a place where they weren't the only one. Mm -hmm right where they could be around you know they'd gone to high school and they were and they you know had positive experiences but you know still predominantly white high schools and they were so intentionally intentionally uh searching for a place to where they could be you know feel more at home feel more themselves um so it wasn't those aren't things that i had to think about necessarily uh, growing up, um, but it's 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 sensitized. You know, I, you, you got a lot to process in that. <laughs> so, how do you think that's impacted you today, and especially at um, like Case Western Reserve, a predominantly white institution? Besides mm -hmm. the other schools that you attended, right. is that, and especially from Trinidad to HBCU, and then in this environment where. You're like, where are the people that look like me? <laughs> well, and I, I it's, it is funny that like you know not not I'm talking all about it. Too. It's, it is funny to reflect. I mean, I'll just say as an aside it, with Michigan, my recruitment weekend. So I wasn't even starting the program. Uh, you know, in 2003, that's I think, and maybe Rob will know better than I. I was the first or second affirmative action suit that the university was involved with. So I was there 
as an undergrad going into grad school with the Students of Color of Rackham Graduate Students Organization, trying to organize around uh, affirmative action. You know, I was there, I must have been the first, I was there when the second <laughs> one um, where eventually the, the voters actually did do away with affirmative action. Uh, and then having to teach, um, you know, as a grad student instructor, you know, what does this mean for for us, and uh, you know, how do we tie that into psychology and behavior? So yeah, to be kind of uh, front and center in those things has been very very interesting. I think I think with Case, uh, I mean, part of what you have to understand too is, I you know identify as a Trinidadian. I'm, I you know have an immigration status to maintain, right? <laughs> You know, at Case, I actually started off on OPT, and you know, for those of you not familiar with that, that's that's where I was still working on the sort of work permission for my student visa, and then going into H one B, the work visa, and now permanent residency with a green card. So I'm not a citizen yet. So, you know, I, I would say the it's not so much the people that look like me, the people with the same immigration status as I, you know, because it is, there is this sense of, uh, I mean, I feel pretty secure, but it sounds like, oh, am I fully part of this? Am I fully part of the fabric? You know, this country, like things could change, I, you know, you just don't know. So there's that sort of level where my head is um, uh, often. But then I think I will say that I, it's really, I have to admit that it's really only been recently. And some, maybe it's something about getting tenure, going on sabbatical, coming back, where I've actually had time to sort of reflect. And um, not to say that in my time, you know, I started in 2010, you know, you had Tamir Rice, you had, I mean, I, and, uh, you know, I've been in, involved in conversations on campus around those, those things. So, you know, definitely salient to me. But part of it too is like, okay, I'm just trying to survive this academic uh, hamster wheel too. <laughs> so now I'm like, okay, let me escape the hamster wheel. I have tenure. Uh, I will say what's hit me, as you said, Heather, you know, that case is predominantly white. I, I think it was maybe spring of 2020. So of course there was a pandemic, uh, but then, you know, George Floyd and, and uh, the protests and, um, I just remember, even before all that started, you know, in trying to design my course on leading organizations, I was like, okay, I want to get guest speakers. I want to have, I want a diverse slate of guest speakers. I want a diverse slate of organizations that my students can study, these undergrads. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, what's the low hanging fruit? Let me reach out to alums. Let me reach out to my network in Cleveland. And it was hard to find you know, people of color. And I was like, wait, I do I not know people of color? <laughs> and I think it just struck me. So there was this internal reflection on my part. Like, what does this mean for my networks? What can I do? And then of course there's a pandemic. So it was like, I don't know how much I can reach out to people <laughs> and form new connections. But it did hit me like, oh, like this network through case is it is mainly um, the majority population, mm -hmm. and and it was just something I had not really been conscious of. And but I think once I set that intention, like how do I, if I really want this for my students, where I want to intentionally expose them uh, to people that don't necessarily look like them, sound like them, or come from different backgrounds. Um, it, it just hit me that, oh, that's easier said than done if I'm relying on my sort of case network. Yeah. Um, so I've, you know, so, you know, trying to put in extra efforts around that. Um, uh, me personally, I think, and I'll, you know, speaking frankly, it's, you know, it, it can get lonely at case work. We know that with, mm -hmm. not just for people of color, but we know that from the undergraduate experience survey we know that we know we have a lot of work to do as an institution um i think we and again some of this is just coming to the fore as my career progresses and as i can look back and sort of make sense of things and I, you know i see a lot of people just sort of accepting that because they've had to live with it for decades mm -hmm. um 
And you know what we know from change management is you have to equip people, right? If you're going to change, so it would be interesting to see, you know, if the university can take this holistic approach to forming connections and creating a sense of inclusivity, and um, because the folks who've been living it for however long, you know, they just don't know what to do, um, <laughs> right? <laughs> so just all those things are kind of hitting me in the past couple of years, <laughs> really just like, oh, wow, this is the folks that I might be reaching out to, to say, you know, how do we build connection? How do we, uh, and these are folks of color as well. Mm -hmm. um, they've had, what I've sort of come to accept is they've, uh sort of accepted the system right. as it is in order for them to survive right to their credit but then you know so when we want to change how do we do that and i think that answer is still so yeah just a lot that i've i've been able to reflect on just in the past few years um yeah and i think you know someone actually just shared i was in a meeting earlier today and we were talking about that because they asked me well what do you think the response if i reach out to people specifically they're talking about black people i reach out are they going to want to connect with me and i said mm -hmm. it depends on the people <laughs> because there are some people who have just be like you said they've become accustomed to the environment that they come to work they do their work then they leave and then there's others that are really looking for community and really looking for the opportunity to connect and i guess i take it for granted because although i've been in predominantly white institutions i've been connected to the black community specifically through church through my sorority and through community organizations yeah. which gives me an outlet outlet but not only and i think about my sorority is how many of us are actually employees at Case West Reserve. Mm -hmm. um, and many of us are faculty, some are administrators, but in that you, um, I've taken for granted that community that I have versus when it's someone who's not a part of either the Cleveland area or um, uh, other organizations right. that connect them to that community. I think, uh, BP Solomon actually put the case in the chat, JP. Yes, yes, that, yes. Yeah, yes. So Grutter versus Grotz, I think yeah. that's how you say it, at University of Michigan. I do want to let uh, the listening audience know that if you have questions for Dr. Stevens, please, by all means, put those in the chat. I do watch the chat for questions. So if anyone has questions, what is it that you like about being an academic? <laughs> I get to be a big nerd and get paid for it uh, <laughs> i but i will say i mean you know i just love they ask my ask if you call my mother right now she'd be like that boy would read everything in this house and you know he throw a newspaper on the floor and he's reading news and it's true and so i i love ideas but i also like making a difference through those ideas um and i think in a, a more applied field like mine like you get to do that um but specifically in the case of organizational behavior i get to satisfy my curiosity about what motivates people what they're passionate about um at work because i think work potentially right not for everybody but if we are if we all could be so privileged where we actually get to pursue our passion with our work, where perhaps eventually work is, is a calling, um, and to be able to study that and to be, and I love being out in the field, right? I've done experiments, I've done surveys, but what I really love is doing ethnographic work where I'm in the field with people in their place of work, shadowing, observing, interviewing, maybe participating myself um, maybe in the work I'm doing now, maybe even intervening based on what I learned, but, but I'm there, you know, I, I get to, I get to be part of all these different worlds. Right. So there's my own curiosity. And I think that's, that's, I don't think I've ever really thought of it this way, but, you know, reading for me and my love of books and comics and everything is just, I love, discover i love new worlds i love traveling right and and reading lets you travel right right in your armchair 
Um, but I can see the connection where being able to explore people at work puts me into their world and I can, I can see and I can feel um, what they do but, and why they do it and how they do it. Um, you know, I've, you know, my dissertation work was on the experience of beauty in the large community choir that I sang with. Um, that's why, you know, people are showing up to create something beautiful. You said the experience of beauty? Yeah. yeah. Okay, tell us more, JP. <laughs> Dr. Stevens, we have to hear more about this research. <laughs> oh, God, where to start? Uh, so, <laughs> uh, I, I've always been interested in, so interested in people, the live performance of work. I've always, like, how are people doing things in real time, right? So, like I said, at Hopkins, I was in a language and cognition lab. Um, you know, cognition is a big part of psychology. Uh, be emotions are a huge part of psychology. Mm -hmm. So behavior, emotions, cognition, how do they all come together? And for me, I was always just very curious about what's happening. It's not just that we think a thought and then perform an action. It's like, these things are coinciding in real time. And, and with organizations, you're interacting with other people experiencing the same stuff and you're affecting each other. It's a lot if you really think about it. So like what's going on <laughs> in that, those complex situations of, you know, folks having to work together. Um, and so beauty comes up because that's what emerged in the choir. I thought the choir would be a really uh, sort of ground zero for, if I want to understand how people work together to produce something as a as a collective that's what choirs do all the time uh it's also what i think any organization does um and part of the experience of a choir hopefully hopefully it's experiencing beauty that we we're creating something where we feel like we sound as one and the sound itself has this holistic quality to it um, that that we intend right whether it's sad or happy or whatever um, and there's also moments though where we aren't sounding as beautiful <laughs> when things are going off the rails a little bit uh, so basically my study captured how that sensation which you know I define in terms of aesthetic experience that sensation of the whole situation coming together, falling apart, coming together, falling apart in real time. Uh, that's how people knew when and how to adapt as they're singing alongside other people. Uh, so when things are beautiful and we sound, you know, I could feel the whole bass section as if it was my voice. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna continue doing what I'm doing. But when I realized, you know, I sort of, I turned to the wrong page or the conductor is doing something different or the soprano started early, you know, that prompts a set of, well, it prompts a, oh crap, <laughs> what's going to happen next? So there's an emotional reaction. But then there's also this sense of, okay, I need to shift gears. I need to adapt. Um, so that research was really focused on we know that groups, organizations have to be resilient. They have to adapt. People need to respond to each other in real time. Um, but what we haven't really understood as well is the fact that it's a complex situation. We, we don't really, we can't really necessarily pinpoint, oh, it's, it's this specific thing and that specific thing I need to address. Sometimes it is just a feeling that something's off. Um, so trying to document like what that what that's all about and how that's useful for uh, how people adapt as they coordinate with each other. Um, so that's what that was about. So uh, did you did you concept how did you define beauty? Did you put a definition actually with it? Did you conceptualize it or did you? Yeah, well, you know, there's a lot that's been written on beauty uh, throughout the ages. <laughs> um, and, but then there's also the sort of lived experience of beauty that that myself my my fellow singers provide and my conductor and i also had an interview study with conductors i was trying to talk to them about how they do what they do um but it's in those two ways that i described for at least for for my fellow singers it's 
a beautiful moment, which is what I asked him to describe is where we, the group, it feels like we're one unit, that we're literally all on the same page. Um, even though we're each doing our different parts, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, but also beauty is where the music, the sound itself feels as if, you know, all the parts are lined up where they need to be. Uh, and of course we have an orchestra on stage too. So, you know, if they're off, we could be a little off and all that sort of stuff. Um, so you have the, the people, and this is like in any organization, right? You have the people that are doing the tasks, but then you have the task itself. Um, so both of those sort of elements um, each need to feel sort of coherent as if all the parts are fitting together and some, you know, the whole is greater than some of the parts, basically. And it's in this um, really appealing, pleasing way. Um, so there's this emotional uh, aspect to it where it's like, you know, things are fitting together or not in a certain way. And that's the sort of aesthetic aspect. But then it makes me feel good or it makes me feel not so good. Right. <laughs> that's the emotional side of it. Yeah. I love it. And I'm just thinking. So then my next question is, Dr. Stevens, do you sing? If I sing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I haven't sung. I actually sang with Kay's Concert Choir for a couple of years. Did you? Because here's the thing that I'm realizing, that we as faculty and even staff and administration, we have all of these hidden talents that we I, don't portray <laughs> on campus. So VP Solomon's on the call and he know I picks on him. I pick on him all the time. He is a recording artist. What? People don't know that he sings. And now we got you. So you all can sing while I do a poetry reading over top. Um, who else okay. does, uh, Dr. Jolly does hip hop. <laughs> but not right now. Yeah. Rob, it doesn't mean yeah, right now. No, not right I'm not going to make him sing today, but I'm just, not today. I was just talking in general, VP. We're not going to do the talent today. <laughs> but uh, I think it's just, it speaks though to who we are as people and not only in that creativity coming to the classroom space until our research to allow us to do the things that we do so i um I, it was just great listening to that and, and and when i heard the word beauty i've done several presentations for women and women workshops and 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 especially for undergrads and they always want to talk about this idea of beauty mm -hmm. which is interesting because they're talking about it from this inner being and this physical appearance uh, and, and one thing that we found out that I always charge them with is the idea of Googling beauty mm. and what pops up. Mm. And so then in the image category, when you Google beauty, it's usually white women mm. with a few light skinned blacks featured throughout. But if you type in black beauty, you get the horse. Oh. Right. <laughs> and so it's an exercise that I've done with many of the, you know, the students that I work with in that capacity. And so hearing you talk about it from the perspective of a choir and music and the harmony and coming together to create this beautiful sound is, is wonderful. We've got questions from the chat, so I won't prolong those. And the first one comes and says, how does diversity affect organizational behavior? And how do we move the needle? So it's kind of a two part and, and how does diversity affect organizational behavior? And then in that, how do we move the needle? Yes, yeah, so this is a question I've been grappling with. If hopefully you could cite me at some, I don't know. So there's a whole field of diversity, equity, inclusion. I know justice has mattered to it. Uh, and I'm, I'm lucky enough to call some of these experts my, my friends. Um, that I've you know been connected with since grad school and and they've really stepped up in amazing ways, you know, taking a scholarly path. I mean, just I was talking about Laura Morgan Roberts, Stephanie Crary, Courtney McClooney, and and you know these women, of course men, but you know these women really stand out to me. Um, you know, just in 2020 with everything that was going on, they got stuff out. They just. We need to have our voices heard. You know, Tina Opie, she's doing amazing work. Um, so anyway, I, I just want to shout them out because I think, okay, those people are experts. I don't think of myself as an expert. What's interesting though is I study coordination, which is 
really fundamentally about diversity. <laughs> it's about, except it, it isn't necessarily framed in terms of um, demographic diversity. It's usually framed in terms of functional diversity and professional diversity. Um, so when I did that power diversity lecture a few years ago, um, I, I was trying to bridge those two, like what is it about, what we understand about bridging differences and coordination. How, like, how, how can that help us understand how to bridge differences based on maybe more deeper, more entrenched kinds of differences? Um, uh, so organizations are fundamentally diverse entities. Um, uh, there's, you know, differences amok. Uh, diversity, I, I, the point I really want to make and, and write about, hopefully soon, diversity is fundamentally a numerical quality. Right, it's a quality of a group, not of an individual, um, and that's why an organization we can say, "Hey, we need more people of color. We need more women. We need more LGBT people. We need, but we also need more engineers. We also need more designers. We also, you know, and that's about numbers. But as I think everybody on this call appreciates, what we really care about is inclusion." And inclusivity and I think we I think that's where the disconnect is with sort of theory and practice um, where it, we're well aware that we need diversity and there's this you know argument for uh, having different perspectives and that variety is needed for better creativity and more innovation so that's sort of uh, uh, the bottom line argument um, but then, you know, are people actually being invited to dance, right? right. Not just to dance. And I and think you know, JP, I'm going to throw something in really quick. So I was on a call with someone when we were talking about the inclusion aspect mm -hmm. and just hearing you use that statement, uh, cause we use it all the time. Mm -hmm. Diversity is being asked to the dance. Inclusion is being asked to dance. And then someone threw in a third part for me, which I thought I loved is that inclusion is also what type of music are they playing and right. wants me to dance? <laughs> right. right, right. So literally, do I even have a, a, a seat at the table to plan this dance? Mm -hmm. And like to have, you know, a voice about like how we will enjoy ourselves together. Right. Um, so no, I appreciate that. So I think that's where the, the research, the theory, the practice, I think we, we're not there yet, right? That gap between the sort of numerical presence, but then how do we actually intentionally, you know, what's the stuff? What's the, what are the practices? What are the, how do we design interactions? How do we reward certain kinds of behaviors versus others so that there is inclusion? And it's not, you know, you don't, it's not just turning some dials, but that, you got to start somewhere. Yeah. But just appreciating, for me, talking about, you know, beauty, aesthetic experience. I care a lot about experience and how people feel. Um, and I think how people feel in organizations is what determines whether they stay or go. So that's why I think that diversity and then inclusion and what that space in between the two is where you can, that's the space where that might make or break organizations in the public eye, right? That might make or break organizations trying to recover from the great resignation, right? That might make or break organizations um, under the scrutiny of millennials who are saying, I want to have a purpose. You're not giving me a purpose. You're, you're not values driven, purpose driven. You're only saying this on paper, but you're not actually um, walking the walk. Um, so, so to me, that's where, so the rubber hits the road with uh, diversity, inclusion, and organizational behavior. Um, but I would say there are people much more expert than I <laughs> who've given, you know, a lot more thought to this. But this is something that I, you know, I care about experience, right? I'm an organizational psychologist. I think how human be like our experience and our felt experience mm -hmm. is really important for understanding how we navigate the world in general. But I think specific to organizations, um, that feeling of inclusion, we know that a sense of belongingness is a fundamental human need. Yes. Um, so how that's being met or not is, is really key to success at work.
Yeah. And, and we know sense of belonging, as you said, is Maslow's hierarchy needs. And I think that's, and that's what creates also longevity with organizations is that feeling as you're saying, that feeling, mm -hmm. how do I feel when I'm in this organization and a part of this organization? Right. Um, as a young African, well, technically we have to reword this. <laughs> African, but okay. yeah, African diaspora Trinidad Tobago professor who works with more experienced and the more mature in age professors. What advice would you give to the younger upcoming faculty in terms of walking in confidence and embracing the knowledge and skill you have and not be intimidated by your surroundings, so to speak? That's a great question. I think, okay, now I can sort of... Uh see what wisdom I've gained <laughs> over 12 years. It's- I, You've been here 12 years? Yeah, yeah. I don't, I, didn't, I don't think I realized it was that long. Oh yeah, well, you don't need to say it quite like that. <laughs> I didn't mean it that way, Dr. <laughs> Stevens. I just, I don't know for some reason, but I guess, yeah, you probably, that probably is right because when I think now I'm going on seven years, so probably, yeah, okay. Yeah. So I, I've learned a lot and I think, because I struggle with that as well. I'm the youngest person in my department. There's nobody. <laughs> and, and I'm in a department, you know, Heather knows these folks. They're people are having grandkids. They're, you know, they're at a different stage of life and they career. So very generative product. And they want, you know, they, they, they love what they do and they're going to keep doing it. But just a different life stage. But, but they've also experienced this particular institution, you know, 20, 30 years now. They've also experienced other institutions. Um, this is my first job out of grad school. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think I still know a few things. Uh, I think, you know, I teach negotiations. And so that informs how I would answer this. Um, it's uh, one of the underlying premises in good negotiations principal negotiations is to understand the underlying interests um, of the other party. So that means not just looking at their position, right? And I've faced some position. This is like the outward stance, like I know everything, my way they high. And I don't know if that's what you're facing necessarily, Angela, but um, there's certainly that sense of, okay, these people have very clear positions, uh, very secure positions, <laughs> a lot of power. Um, and not necessarily in a bad way, but you know, they, they have their thing going. They have their own ecology, as I kind of put it. So where do I fit in? So I do think it takes, I mean, especially this first, you know, three years, right? I, and I was on a nine year tenure clock, which is why I've been here so long. Uh, <laughs> the first, first three years, um, yeah, before your third year review for your tenure track faculty member, uh, a really important, uh, and I and I think it took me a while to realize, um, like you, there's a lot of work on your part, um, for better or for worse. I think the reality is, with very busy people, who, um, you know, best of intentions, uh, they're doing their thing. You know, they 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 they've built their their work and their environment uh in ways that suit them mm -hmm. so i think finding ways to connect with them um which can sometimes take effort um but my sense is that they they would be keen to say yes to an invitation um to to understand like what are they working on what do they care about um and also some of their as you get to know them, what's some of their history? What are they experience in the institution? Because that would help you understand why they do the things that they do. <laughs> and, then, and then you need to understand, like you said, embracing your own knowledge and skills, but also your underlying interests. So the underlying interests are the underlying motivations and needs. So what are, what are the needs that they're trying to fulfill, right? It could be need for achievement, need for recognition need to um, give back and give leave a legacy, right? You see a lot of that. Um, but for me, at least when I started to realize that, it, things kind of clicked like, oh, that's why they're doing it. Like they, they have a sense of pride over the things that they've done. So I may say X, Y, Z, and it may sound like a criticism of something that they've done. 
and I won't realize it, right? Um, so understanding that, oh, okay, like I want to have a sense of pride in my work. I want to leave a legacy. Like I can, I can empathize with where they're coming from. How do I sort of build that bridge? Um, now that I really grasp their underlying interests and motivations, um, but that that takes um, getting to know them as people, and that's the tough part, I think, you know, and that takes some time to but I, but also at the same time while you sort of reflecting on your own underlying needs and motivations as and learning about theirs you don't give up your own underlying motivations right, right? You, you're, you're trying to just build that bridge and see where the two can meet yeah you know what's um i think you you can tell that you study human behavior <laughs> Because you can always listen to language that people use uh -huh. to know the impact. And, and so I'm just listening because I, I taught a human behavior class. Mm -hmm. And so listening to for social work. And okay. so listening to you, uh, I, I, you can really tell and where your passion and interest lies in terms of making a difference as it relates to how we interact with one another. And I think that's, um, and that's probably why you're such a great person to be around. You know, when Dr. Stevens comes in the room, it's just a light, like he's just a light in the room and, and great to be around. Right. And I think that's the thing someone said in the chat, I think Angela is also a recording artist. So going back to our, uh, <laughs> going back to our, our talented people on the call, but here's a question. How do you just juxtapose beauty, joy, and happiness? Yes. Oh, you're welcome, Angela. Uh, to Irma. So, okay, and I'm going to get nerdy and technical and you might disagree with me. But to me, there's um, so something that's beautiful. It's about what we call the formal qualities, which is the form itself. So, so this iPhone has a certain form to it. It has a certain shape, certain dimensions, um, certain length, width. Uh, a certain reflectivity of the glass, a certain ease of use. Um, there's a certain way it feels in my hand and how it looks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All those, in this case, these are physical visual dimensions come together in a certain way, right? And so how that comes together in a certain way is the aesthetic. This is, uh, you might say an Apple aesthetic, a Steve Jobs aesthetic those dimensions all fit in a way that give the iPhone its unique character, right? We can, we can tell like it's an iPhone, we can tell it's something that looks like an iPhone, right? right. Uh, so to me, beauty is similar in that it's about the formal qualities. Uh, and, you know, we talk about beauty and art, mainly not so much beauty and organizations. But to me, a beautiful organization is where, you know, I study construction sites, for instance, um, you know, are the architects, engineers, trades, consultants in that meeting that we just had. So I sit in a lot of meetings. <laughs> uh, was this synchrony, right? Did this sound like a, like a chorus? Like, did mm -hmm. this sound like a unit or were they all like talking past each other? Um, so that has to do with how the parts are fitting together as a whole. To me, that's fundamental to a definition of beauty. But then what's, what gets associated with that is an emotion, right? An emotion is also a feeling or it's known through feeling, um, but it has this affective quality, meaning it's, it feels good or it feels bad. And emotions are also associated with um, move, movement towards a stimulus and movement away. Um, whereas to me, the aesthetic side is really what are, what are the qualities and how they fit together of what I'm experiencing? Um, I think the emotion is what's that feeling that's associated with the aesthetic that either pulls us towards it or says, ah, oh, yeah, I don't like that. Right. Um, so that's how I would sort of uh, tease apart the two. Of course, beauty. The thing is, we're humans, right? So we're experiencing all these things all at once. <laughs> um, I, and then you know us academics try to tear it all apart. <laughs> that, in right. my head, that's, that's how those uh, can be distinguished. 
So here's, uh, we have two more questions from the chat and then I'll wrap it up with um, a couple of questions that I have, but I am new to the Office of Professional Programs and, and I'm assuming this is Case School of Engineering. Mm -hmm. So I'm still learning about the culture protocols for reaching out to Case CSE faculty discuss in-class projects with industry and internship opportunities. I loved hearing about your concept of, hum of the humble consultant. Could you share more about how to be student-centered within the K School of Engineering cult culture and be more collaborative using your philo philosophy and concept and thought? Well, now. <laughs> well, I, I could try to respond, yeah. Right, I'll let, I'll let Dr. Stevens try to respond to that. I think that's one of the things too, is that when we think of organizations and especially even within our own institution is that each of our colleges have their own culture. Yeah, and, and so certain concepts can't be transcended to certain spaces, but that, you know, but I'm well, sure that can be transcended, but I'm going to let you answer. Well, I'll, <laughs> I, I'll just say we're working on it. So I'm actually on a committee, uh, Anne Borchert from uh, Corporate Relations is, is heading it. We had Drew Poppleton from, uh, you know, uh, postgraduate experience and planning. Uh, there's a host of people that are actually working on how do we do a better job at all across the university across different levels and schools to work with industry um, so there's something happening at the system central level um, i have been working with the cleveland clinic for almost uh, eight years now um, and you know at the management school we we're still figuring this out right so, um, I would say, I mean, my first reaction as I read this in the chat is like to meet people where they are, mm -hmm. particularly if you know that they are, again, they're entrenched. The thing of like change, change management, yeah. understanding, like, oh, they have a history of doing things a certain way. Like why change the status quo? So, uh, you know, I'm sure this isn't quite in line necessarily with humble consultant, consulting, Ed Shine's work, but it's okay. How do I you know, first step is to understand what are their needs, right? So going back to negotiations, underlying interests, what is it that they're trying to accomplish with their class? And then how can what you're offering complement that and, and build on that? Um, how can you anticipate where they may feel threatened, where they may feel, where, where because of what they're doing in their class, um, they may feel that whoever's approaching them, um, is coming at it obliquely and it's, it's like oh trying to substitute something or get rid of something um i think because i think the result can be student-centered without necessarily using the term student-centered right mm -hmm. this is all but right you write this all about the students and saying hey you designed this class um however many years ago or last year and and you designed a certain way with very good intentions and purpose um Tell me more about that purpose. Tell me, just tell, and what is it that folks do and, and, and where are you struggling or what seems to be working well or, or not as well? And then, say, and then say, okay, well, here's how this opportunity might be helpful. I will say for faculty, like I mentioned before, the struggle to find a diverse pool of guest speakers, a diverse slate of organizational sites. There's a lot of work for faculty. <laughs> and, we, and we don't often, particularly, you know, yeah from research faculty to go the extra mile with teaching, there's that the rewards aren't set up for that. Um, so to the extent that you can, and of course you may not have a ton of resources yourself, but to the extent you can say, hey, I'm here to support this class to meet the goals that you have. Uh, I'm not just, I'm not trying to put a burden on you, right? So, Hopefully that can be made very clear. Um, mm -hmm. Just how is it meeting these these uh, underlying interests that they have? Um, uh, healthcare workers. So yes, I'm, I'm I want to go. I don't want to leave Cheryl. I think that's um, with the well, the just really quickly with your question with the culture and protocols for reaching out to Case um, School of Engineering faculty. Uh, I don't, you, you probably would check with, um, and I know someone in their school that handles a lot of the diversity aspects and that's Lauren Biddlecom, but with, with their student, she's working with different, uh, different constituents to try to really improve that relationship and that culture when it comes to students and 
fact, well, students and faculty and students, everyone within the school. So she may be a great contact as well as when I think about this question, I'm really stuck on this question for some reason. Could you share more? About, because I think, as you said, JP, is really thinking about, and not to dwell on this, but thinking about what the goal is. Mm -hmm. Because for faculty, one thing we have to make sure is that when we're talking about faculty and we're dealing with faculty, they have a lot on them. And I shared this earlier, is that we wanna give them new assignments and new techniques and everything else, but we don't take the time to teach them how to do it. And so enough. sometimes it's, as you mentioned with negotiations, it's really the idea that you've got to make faculty think they're not doing more work. So whatever you do when you're talking about doing student center or anything, you cannot, <laughs> you have to present it where faculty believe I don't have to do anything else than what I'm doing now. Well, and just to tie it back to the humble, because the whole idea of humble consulting, humble inquiry, humble leadership, these are uh, Edgar Schein's uh, work. It's really just coming from a place of, you know what? I don't know. Yeah. I may be an expert and nobody's taking that away. However many decades of experience, however many credentials that, that, but with you in this moment, you person X, who I'm trying to work something out with, I don't know you and everything about you. I don't know about your take on this specific situation. So, so I'm going to ask about it before I impose or offer a suggestion. It's like, you know, let me, let me ask more questions than, right. um, than, you know, talk. <laughs> yes. So with the last question, I think you read it kind of briefly with yeah, the uh, Brazil, your studies on resiliency and healthcare and um, their understanding that healthcare workers are quitting their jobs. So the question to you is, can this be resolved or how should it be addressed? Yeah, and my face is like this because I'm married to one. And I'm so, so I live, oh, I'm, yep. So <laughs> these are conversations that I live with. Um, it's bad, y'all. I just wanna, yeah. I'm not trying to scare anybody, <laughs> but my mother always said, Growing up in Trinidad, she's like, don't get sick in this country, you know. And now I'm like, oh, don't get sick in this country either. Um, and we see that even before we get into racial disparities. Right. It's just like, it, it's all fair game. It's, the hospital systems are not equipped to deal with people. <laughs> it's just, and they don't treat their employees like people. And I know that firsthand. Yeah. Um, and so... I think I look, I just I don't even know what I'm sorry we're at the end, but they don't they they re, there really is this sort of mechanistic view. And maybe it comes from there's a lot of crit, you know, critical work that's been written about the medical view of bodies and um not the you know, black bodies, right? But just I the way they treat nurses and physicians, it's actually quite similar. Mm -hmm. Right? Like work twelve hours yeah. at night, then turn around, work twelve hours a day. And that, you know, and so there's a fundamental systemic, this is why I'm sort of like, I don't even know where to begin, because there's a set of beliefs and values that are tearing people down, mm -hmm. right? So it's not just, let's pay nurses more, or, you know, it's this, and the system's so entrenched. Um, you know, one answer is socialized healthcare. It's one answer. Um, and of course, that's not a real answer. It's like, what, what goes into that? But this sort of uh, not-for-profit yet profit-driven model, <laughs> the HMO model, like all this stuff is just yeah. not working, right? The current sort of capital, I guess because it's founded on capitalism and healthcare, if you're going to view it as a commodity, then I think that's the underlying issue rather than a right. So that, that to me is the underlying issue. And that's like a public policy kind of thing. Cause you could train docs, you could train nurses to be as humanistic as possible. But when you throw them into a system where it's all about RVUs, where you only have 10 to 15 minutes with a patient, that's the system. Like these are people that want to spend time listening. To, they want to empathize and, um, but they, they can't, you know. Um, so it is a, a, there's some really, yeah, crazy things that have to happen. We need a radical, radical change. Yeah. And, and so we're at our time, we're at our time. 
we're at our hour mark, but I will leave you with this last question, just so the audience knows you a little different than Dr. Stevens. What is it that Dr. Stevens likes to do in Cleveland, Ohio? Ooh, you know, so we just got a boat. <laughs> yeah, so I grew up sailing um, and my husband and I, we got a boat last August. I wish, and I live half a mile from the lake. I'm in Gordon Square. Just, okay. You know, I really wish that everybody in Cleveland could see Cleveland from the water. It's such a different view. Yeah, of it the, is. It really I'm is. Appreciating the resource that is the lake too. Um, so I love say I love being on. I love, I love being close to water. So that's basically. <laughs> And a boat certainly helps with that. But I, I had a friend say that last season, last season, like they did just like seeing, being out on a boat at some point really gives you a different stance and orientation to the city. Um, and I wish folks from East and West, rich and poor, black and white, what like could see that mm -hmm. and have that opportunity. So I think that would be cool. Yes, I agree. Seeing the city from the water is completely different than seeing the city from any other perspective. Uh, thank you, Dr. Stevens. It has been great talking to you. Um, I have enjoyed the conversation and we've gotten good, you've gotten good remarks in the chats about the conversation also. Um, and that it's fabulous and engaging. And so uh, I I thank you and um, on behalf of the Office Inclusion, Diversity and Equal Opportunity, the African and African American Studies minor, as well as Quad A, the African and African American Alumni Association. I got all my African and African Americans and Black yeah. things mixed up tonight, it's too much. But in that, I thank you. And this is actually our last profile for the academic year. And so, um, Thank you for closing us out for the 21-22 academic year. Uh, and we look forward to seeing each and every one of you next year. Well, no, I guess this year in uh, probably <laughs> September or October for our first uh, Profiles of Inclusive Excellence. Everyone have a great evening. You too.